Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming. Tonight I have the pleasure of introducing a dear friend and colleague, Dominic Leong. Dominic is adjunct assistant professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation and a principal of Leong Leong, an architecture office and creative agency founded in 2009 by Dominic and his brother Christopher Leong. The office has worked with a wide range of clients, from Philip Lim, Everlane, and Opening Ceremony, to Sweet Green and Triple Canopy. Last year, Leong Leong completed the Anita May Rosenstein campus in West Hollywood, which serves Los Angeles' LGBTQ community through an architecture that synthesizes social services and affordable housing into a porous urban campus. Leong Leong has been the recipient of the Architecture League of New York's Emerging Voices Award, the AIA New York New Practices Award, and has been recognized as a design vanguard by Architectural Record. In 2014, Leong Leong designed the US Pavilion for the Venice Architecture Biennale, and has been exhibited in the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. In the early days of Leong Leong, Chris and Dominic would produce self-published, small-run books for each project they completed, whether the project was realized or not. At that time, most of their peers were either working for offices or developing a resume of academic work. Chris and Dominic, on the other hand, insisted on developing a practice committed to building, working with clients who were giving their then young office opportunities to build, and they still insist on building. Building being always important to Chris and Dominic, building was always important to Chris and Dominic, but so was discourse. Discourse with each other, discourse within the office, with their peers, with the discipline, with the canon, but most importantly with themselves. They were committed to thinking through ideas realized and latent in their work, and they never hesitated returning to ideas and building on work that was either produced or not. They were committed, sorry, and they, they, they still are in, in, in many ways practicing this, this iterative process. Tonight you will see how both buildings and works have informed their particular way of architectural making and how developing this feedback loop between architectural thinking and questioning one's own workflow can create new ground for architectural production and speculation. I would like to underline this idea of being in dialogue with oneself and remaining curious about how and why one produces work. Having known Dominic for over a decade now, I have seen him create time and space for personal self-reflection. From this space, I've seen him develop an innate sensitivity, receptivity, and appreciation for the material conditions of buildings and bodies. Strange as it may be, as architects, we sometimes forget the latter. That is, being attuned to the material conditions, the needs, and the desires of the human body. This attunement to the haptic and the tactile, to all abilities and embodied sensations, plays itself out most immediately in a line of work that draws on Michel Foucault's late writings on techniques of the self. You will see this explicitly in projects like Float Tank One, Fermentation One, and a toolkit for a newer age. But it is also there, latent in the early work, before they have the words to articulate this deep concern for the techniques, technologies, and rituals of self-care of which architecture is just one. Please join me in welcoming Dominic Leong to UCLA. Okay. Is my mic on? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, Jake. That was a really nice intro. I um, also really appreciate being here at UCLA. It feels um, familiar, having spent a lot of time in LA, so um, it's nice to um, talk to you guys. This, um, this lecture is sort of a first draft of, of, a, of so I kind of um, just started working on it, so bear with me at certain moments, it might meander a bit. Uh, sorry. Um, so yeah, so this is our office in New York. Um, we've been in, on the Bowery for a number of years, almost um, seven years in, in, just in four offices on the Bowery. Um, like Jake said, this is my brother Chris. Uh, we're 17 months apart. This is us at Couples Therapy, um, which we go to on a weekly basis. And 
if any of you have partners, either professional or personal, um, you know how kind of productive this, this space can be. And I think it's actually been pretty formative in terms of how we've developed our practice and how we work, work with ourselves and work with um, other people. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the 10 years to date. So this, this lecture is a little bit like of taking stock of the last, um, well, it's almost 11 now. Um, well, we started off in 2009. Um, and what was happening then was obviously the economic crash. Um, and I think beyond just the fact that, um, you know, we thought if we could, you know, start at the downturn, we could survive anything. I think it actually marked a very unique uh, course of 10 years that I think really defines a certain generation of architects. Um, I think we feel that we are sort of in between generations that our brains were sort of formed pre-internet, um, but a lot of our work um, and a lot of our clients were sort of post, post internet generation. So we're in this kind of liminal space, um, which I think is quite unique and quite defining. Um, so it's almost like a three or four year uh, uh, time frame. I'm 41, my brother's 42. Um, and so the, the beginning of our practice is really defined by this kind of transition from like an internet culture into actual like built, um, built projects. Um, so I actually just started going through the server, um, trying to take stock of what we'd done in the past 10 years. Um, and it was really interesting just to do some kind of statistics. Um, it's been 280 proposal or potential projects. We've uh, developed 177 proposals. We've only done 18 competitions, like Jake was saying. It's really been, uh, we actually try to avoid competitions as much as possible, which I think is also a huge kind of generational shift. Previously, competitions were sort of the defining medium for architectural production and dissemination. Out of those, we've done 67 projects that have been complete um, and 14 projects that are in process. And I think oftentimes our, you know, architectural practices edit what they show. And in a way, this I'm sort of working through this lecture is breaking the fourth wall of what the reality of practice is for, for a, a younger emerging practice in today's world. Um, so we have a kind of broad range of, of projects from you know, exhibition installations. We've done 39 retail stores, six galleries, 13 workspaces, uh, some version of 12 multifamily housing, seven private houses, either in process or kind of um, in construction. Uh, we've worked on four community-oriented projects, three hotels, two not actual museums, but sort of parts of museum, and then one campus, which is the LGBT campus. And the way we've always sort of talked about our practice is that it's not a linear trajectory. We um, feel that it's actually more of a feedback loop. So I think there is sort of this mythology uh, built into the architectural education that you sort of inherit this kind of uh, uh, history of ideas. You define a certain project, you go into the profession, you learn how to uh, be an architect, and at some point you produce work that uh, affects a larger context. And uh, from the very beginning, we always kind of thought about our practice as a feedback loop where are kind of disciplinary obsessions that um, you know work within a space of autonomy of the practice are being vetted relative to professional issues and sort of absorbing context and cultural issues. And there's a kind of constant white, uh, kind of flywheel uh, sort of vetting the relevance of different different ideas. So in a lot of the work, there's you know interest in like figure field, envelope, ambiguity, organization, diagram, estrangement, boundaries, and context. And then Early on, we really uh, became obsessed with control, and it was sort of at this this point in time in the uh, you know 2000, early kind of 2006, 2007, 2008, where digital technology was sort of creating this kind of fetishized notion of um, um, kind of rapid prototyping, and we were finding that that actually didn't wasn't an effective way to practice in the real world for us. Um, and then always kind of thinking about these larger issues of collectivity, um, media, lifestyle, um, increasingly energy and uh, ecology and labor and politics. Um, so this is our first office. This is actually a townhouse we uh, worked on. I was living in the townhouse. Um, and at the same time, um, what was happening um, was this new wave of uh, Asian American fashion designers that were sort of exploding around 2010. And it just so happened, uh, I was working with a group of friends uh, formerly under the name of, of Pair Project, 
And we got a client named Philip Lim, who was an Asian American fashion designer who was kind of blowing up at the time. Um, and that was sort of the genesis of, of our kind of opportunity to launch the practice. And so we were working both very locally within the context of New York, renovating this historic townhouse, and also globally doing a fashion flagship store in Seoul, Korea in 2010. And so our practice is really defined by this kind of combination of being totally local and totally global simultaneously. Um, and what we were sort of um, riding was this sort of wave of globalization, even though there was this kind of down economic downturn that uh, this kind of Asian American fashion designers were finding a, a huge audience in Asia. So this is a Philippine fashion sh uh, show in Beijing, China. And so that sort of led to this kind of ongoing collaboration with um, this particular client for about five and a half years in which we did a number of stores as pair projects in West Hollywood, their flagship store. Um, and this also sort of coincided with this kind of emerging uh, experience economy. Um, so there's a sort of fascinating uh, um, uh, um, condition where capital expenditure was kind of declining in terms of doing build outs uh, for fashion companies, but then experience economy was sort of exploding. So then what you basically have are the kind of like pop-up installation typology that emerges in like 2010 and becomes a pr kind of predominant mode of exploration for younger generation. Um, this book was kind of re-updated uh, uh, in 2011, the experience economy. So we more or less uh, rode this wave of developing uh, retail interiors as these sort of experiential um, concepts. We actually had no idea how to do retail. They didn't work as retail spaces. They were purely about branded spaces. Um, so going from Philip Lim to CKM to small shops in uh, New York to doing project for Everlane. Um, most recently, a project for a fashion flagship uh, called, uh, sorry, a denim company called R13. Um, which is more or less like a, a media gallery, um, and then some interior spaces in, in Las Vegas for a, for a casino. And then, so at the same time, we were developing these um, this kind of retail experience. We were also doing these kind of cult uh, more culturally oriented pop-ups in uh, the context of New York. So these were all self-built uh, by hand. Uh, none of it was rapid prototype. There was no digital production. Um, it was actually very archaic in how we produced it. Um, so kind of moving also into these sort of like experiential designs for cultural events, uh, storefront for an architecture, architecturally creative time. We're really trying to move out of the space of commercial uh, clients to kind of develop our own language autonomous of uh, kind of client demands. Um, and our, our sort of interest in materiality um, started to develop and a kind of language of, um, I would say, um, the kind of, the clarity of a diagram that's undermined by the um, ambiguity of a material that starts to blur the reading between the, like a plan and a kind of first person perspective or almost a kind of phenomenology. Simultaneously, we're doing a series of galleries uh, in the Lower East Side. Um, eventually that led into doing exhibitions and so all of this is sort of like a very, I would say, New York kind of trajectory of doing interiors. Um, and then eventually that sort of converged on doing on Miami Design District, which was essentially a sort of branded neighborhood in um, which almost feels like um, um, the kind of placeless uh, shopping uh, haven. And in, which you're probably familiar with, but the kind of amazing opportunity that uh, Craig Robbins was giving to young architects to reskin the neighborhood, totally devoid of any kind of programmatic um, engagement, but literally just reskinning. So we produced this uh, skin on a parking garage, which um, has uh, Iwamoto Scott, John Babasari, um, this sort of exquisite corpse trying to break up this parking garage into um, what appears to be three buildings. And, and we realized that what we thought our practice was about was actually um, a lot different, this sort of ref self-reflection on the opportunities that were actually coming to us, which really started um, coming in from, I would say, like the fuzzy boundaries of architectural thinking that moved beyond the kind of building interiors, objects, programming, planning, but actually these um, kind of 
uh, techniques or strategies of building narratives, doing research, experience, branding, trend forecasting. So this became a, a kind of part of our, our model of practice, which I think it's not, it's definitely not unique, um, but we realized that um, kind of shedding the expectations of what we think architectural practice uh, was or should be in sort of accepting the reality of what, um, what opportunities were sort of coming into us through these kind of like fuzzy boundaries of, so we eventually, we, it took us 10 years to figure out what a mission statement was. Um, and so essentially what it sort of means is that we're operating between a kind of traditional architectural studio and a creative consultancy. Uh, recently focused on uh, working with um, more diverse clients, generating cultural resonance and at social agendas within the built environment. So in a way, this sort of is a, is a pivot um, in the probably from the first eight years to the last two in terms of uh, where the, the practice is headed. Um, so this kind of lecture kind of bumps back and forth in time. This, this project that we did in 2012, we realized was actually a very formative project for us in a way it was totally very architectural, not architectural at all. We started um, uh, an art publication, White. Um, and the idea was to take uh, historic food menus and then distribute them to a kind of collection of artists in which they produce new work. So this is Gordon Manor Clark's restaurant, uh, 1970s, that he um, started kind of collective uh, space for the local community of artists in New York. Um, and then we just distribute these, these menu items out to you know, a number of artists, and they kind of free associate and produce these uh, different reactions um, to the menu. And then it all sort of culminated in a, in a dinner that we had uh, a chef um, concept and create around the food, Gordon Matta Clark's food menu. And so we did a series of these publications um, and a series of events, uh, which essentially brought together uh, a community of, of creatives within, yeah, sure. How's that? Okay. Um, so essentially it was like an experiment in collectivity, which um, in the conditions of collectivity and creating collectivity. Um, and so what, what we're currently kind of interested in and sort of like rehashing through a number of projects is this process of informal collectivity in its translation into form or typology. Um, and so this, this arts publication that we produced was really this kind of informal um, gathering of people um, and never kind of evolved to the point of creating a new typology, but uh, the projects I'm gonna talk about um, sort of actually kind of continue through this kind of, this, this journey from the informal to the formal. Um, so you can kind of chart these different um, projects as starting as informal collectivities, which move into like a space to, to inhabit, usually adopting or appropriating a kind of existing space. And then there's an evolution, they, there's an outgrowth of that either through, uh, you know, expansion of programming um, or different types of needs. Um, and eventually there's a kind of new typology that's, that's created out of that. So uh, one of the, our interests in our practice is like, what's this evolution from informal collectivity to formalize new typologies? And then essentially what's this kind of feedback loop with understanding that uh, they're sort of in production, uh, continually evolving uh, together. Um, and so we're thinking about this idea of like physical space is no longer the primary medium for organizing people, information and power then what are the informal and formal conditions of collectivity, contemporary collectivities? Um, and looking at Bruno Latour is kind of a, um, a good guide in the sense that um, 
it's only through these kind of new associations and these kind of processes of becoming which you can identify collectivities. So the projects um, that we're kind of working through um, start to um, give legibility to, I think, these, these new associations. So the first uh, kind of more uh, urban scale project is a headquarters we designed for Asian, Ameri for Asian Americans for Equality, which are a nonprofit um, organization in New York uh, that started in 1974. And it was a result of, um, this is Confucius Tower, which is in Chinatown. Um, and it's sort of like 1970s brutalist uh, building, which was actually kind of a compelling mixed use project that introduced uh, a kind of educational school, uh, school inside of it with uh, affordable housing. Um, but there was a huge backlash from the local Chinese American community because none of the labor in the project uh, were local Chinese uh, people. So there was a huge protest which led to uh, a sort of mobilization of Chinese American um, social activism um, over the course of about the next decade, um, sort of, which is, you know, actually very, very kind of unique for, um, I would say, Chinese American culture to kind of, at this time, uh, voice this sort of political activism. Um, but this group, AFI, started to advocate for affordable housing uh, within the community and also actually uh, working with the city to develop inclusionary zoning to mandate affordable housing for that particular neighborhood. Um, and essentially, the, this project that we started working on uh, was to become their new headquarters in, in Flushing, Queens. So this is Chris Kui, who was the CEO. Um, he is um, here. Um, and so fast forward to 2016, uh, when this organization has sort of evolved to the point of uh, actually developing affordable housing uh, in New York. Uh, and actually producing a, a, um, a whole kind of community of different um, services for Asian American. Uh, this, this project was actually, is actually located in Flushing, which is one of the most dense uh, urban fabrics in New York. Um, and it has this kind of fascinating multi-level uh, urbanism, which is actually kind of reminiscent of, of Hong Kong and other Asian cities. Um, and so this, this particular neighborhood, um, was the site of their new headquarters building and we the site is here on this corner it's actually part of a, a much larger rezoning uh, that was underway at the time which would uh, increase uh, far and actually enable a lot of development in the area and so this is working towards um, the river here laguardia uh, airport is over here and this particular corner site which sort of bookends this main commercial uh, corridor um, off Flushing Ave. And the project's ambition was really to actually try to counteract the displacement and gentrification to enable uh, and give um, resources to small businesses, which are such a huge part of the, the Flushing community. And um, so we, it was a competition which we won. We actually paired up um, with another executive, with another architect who was actually on the competition to basically cut down the odds, um, which worked out. Uh, um, and so we were really looking at this kind of the, the typology of this sort of um, quasi, um, yeah, it's, it's just like a really unique um, kind of split level urbanism that's happening where you, where you have uh, commercial space below the sidewalk um, and this multi-level uh, mixed use, but there's actually very little kind of connection between the floors. Um, so our immediate uh, first move was essentially to try to uh, create these kind of vertical connections that uh, sort of pulled the street up uh, and create a mixed-use uh, kind of organization that connected these different um, retail, community space, and office space. And essentially the, the program, the, the building was sort of like a, a, a convergence or a kind of condenser of um, local entrepreneurs, uh, a food courts, a community space, and then Class A office space for AFI's headquarters. And essentially we were working from the street edge uh, condition, um, introducing this kind of monolithic staircase, um, which would eventually sort of like continue throughout the, the, the verticality of the building. 
um, and looking at this kind of interface and trying to break down essentially this, um, this sort of bi-level split condition, but allowing a, a kind of continuity of program, but also a density of program within the building. Um, so then the stairs eventually become this um, event space. And this, the, you know, the program actually becomes the form working within uh, New York. There's obviously very limited things you can do within a, a zoning envelope. Um, so we had about 12 feet to play with within that uh, zoning envelope. And the idea was to sort of stack the program, shift it back to create these outdoor spaces um, and sort of create this, this like layer cake, uh, this notching of program that would um, continue up and define the edge of the, the street. Um, and create these outdoor spaces. And then we were really interested in this idea that the program would start to create different levels of transparency. And so the more uh, uh, the programs and the, um, the food court connection would be the most transparent. And then the, uh, the, the glazing using kind of like flipping the low E coating uh, from the different, uh, one, the different surfaces would produce uh, a kind of higher level of transparency and reflectivity uh, as the building like moves up and down. And this kind of weird uh, filleted pinch, pinching curve at the edge along the party wall. Um, so the next, the next project is also in New York. And um, in a way, it's a response, I think, to what happened at the High Line, which is this sort of conundrum of uh, open space and uh, development and gentrification. Um, so I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Uh, the effect of the, the zoning changes, which allowed for the kind of explosion of uh, luxury condos, uh, benefit of real estate taxes for the city um, that run up along this axis or this kind of spine of the, um, the, uh, the high line. And the kind of like stock architecture um, kind of competition of who can do the kind of most extravagant architecture that culminates at the shed in Hudson Yards. Um, and the kind of backlash that has sort of happened around that because people are asking like, who's New York is this? Uh, more people go to the High Line apparently than any other cultural institution. Um, and, and it really kind of begs the question of um, <laughs> who are the stakeholders at the table making decisions uh, for the city? and who are the architects and to what degree of homogeneity uh, do they represent in a actually very diverse city. Um, so you zoom out and you start to think about the affordable housing crisis in New York, uh, which was a huge mandate in uh, de Blasio's um, um, uh, election campaign. But the reality that these, these housing issues actually go back to uh, the 80s uh, when AFI, Asian Americans for Equality, were advocating for inclusionary zoning. Um, and this was an RFP put on by the city in Nolita. Um, if you're familiar with this area, there's this amazing garden that's actually owned by the city that's been rented or leased by a, a private uh, individual for the last probably 20 years. And he, he, was did not, he wasn't allowed to renew his lease because it's been slated for, um, for affordable housing. And over the course of the last few years, uh, here, here's the garden right here. It's um, just across the street from you know, some kind of uh, retail, um, bougie little retail stores. Um, it's become this kind of community amenity, uh, even though it's not supposed to be park space, um, the community is sort of adopted because of the the lease owner opened it up and sort of created this kind of conundrum for the city uh, where the, the, uh, the, resident, the kind of local residents don't want to give up this public space because it's actually this great uh, garden. So there's like yoga classes, people hanging out. And so there's this whole kind of community act activism to try to save it, which sort of puts um, you know, these two issues of affordable housing and accessible public space against, pitted against each other. So the city runs this RFP and we're like, this is too crazy, let's not even touch it. It's obviously gonna be a total shit storm. Um, there's no way you can win. But AFI uh, comes to us and say, hey, let's, let's, try, let's try to do this RFP. Um, we're gonna break the rules um, and figure out if we can come up with a solution which essentially uses architecture to solve these problems rather than um, just ignore them. 
And so I think there's this moment in time in, in New York where we need to come up with um, pilot projects which uh, try to solve these issues of accessible public space and affordable housing. Um, and essentially, I think we all know architecture's uh, virtues at trying to solve these are kind of timeless, but um, not always expected. And so essentially, what does it mean to put affordable, senior affordable housing next to um, kind of community park? And how do you work within this kind of very kind of con contextual uh, uh, typology of tenement housing? Um, and essentially, our, our proposal was like, if you do the as of right project, you're gonna, you, you kill the park. So it's 70% built versus 30% open space. Uh, the very obvious answer is to just um, try to keep the park and also get the housing, but just come up with a diagram that does both. Um, this, this essentially um, breaks all the rules. It breaks the street wall. Um, uh, it actually goes a little bit higher. Um, and the whole idea is like, how, how can we actually make an argument that uh, might fly in front of the mayor? Because uh, it would actually uh, require mayor, uh, the mayor to override the zoning code. So we went through this kind of diagrammatic process uh, to produce what we thought was a compelling argument to produce a kind of, uh, kind of urbanism that uh, provided both senior housing and kind of accessible green space and also a network of green spaces within the, the mass of the building. And so essentially what we proposed would um, compromise a little bit on the number of units. We'd lose 20 units, but um, we would gain uh, a significant amount of almost 200% of the kind of open space as well as community space and actually turn this um, infill site into a kind of green network um, that would um, actually connect to another um, affordable housing project just to the south of it. And we got very far. We actually um, got all the way to a meeting with HPD. Uh, storefront for art and architecture was gonna take the ground floor. It was gonna create this whole uh, kind of open space that would allow them to curate in the park. Um, we sat down with them and basically they said, we need, you have to give us an argument to take to the mayor. Um, we thought this was a pretty strong argument um, that uh, even though it broke the kind of street wall that the, the, um, this kind of convergence of open space and, and senior housing seemed to be kind of a no-brainer. Um, but they couldn't, they couldn't get on board with it. It was too, it was too risky um, and they eventually just kind of went with the kind of as the right project which started to kind of mutate into our project strangely. Um, um, so it was kind of disappointing. I felt like we were on the verge of actually pushing um, uh, a kind of model for, uh, for development that the city doesn't really have currently. Um, the, the project was Passive House. It essentially created this kind of um, urban uh, room green, uh, sort of vertical green. So storefront was gonna take this space, senior uh, house, sorry, senior center here which opened up onto a kind of private courtyard for the seniors retail space. And just sort of creating this kind of constellation of programs that would allow the seniors to actually have access to a kind of vibrant uh, public space. And then, you know, working within the very strict HPD guidelines for units is always um, an interesting game to play. It can be quite frustrating because um, it's, it's so restrictive. Um, so, how am I doing on time? I'd be like halfway there. Um, so this project is the Anita May Rosenstein campus, um, which was a, a, a competition that we uh, participated in in 2014. Um, there's, I think, five architects uh, who were invited. Um, and the reason we wanted to participate in it um, was just for the simple fact that we thought that this new campus needed to exist. And we actually had no um, idea that we would win um, and that we thought, you know, if we, we could publish this project, et cetera. Um, but we kind of just, you know, went all in on it and spent about two months uh, designing this. 
but the story of the projects um, kind of goes back to illustrate this kind of evolution from a kind of informal collectivity to a new uh, typology. And um, really starts in um, actually 1959. Um, the LGBT, um, first of all, I don't identify as queer. Um, and this project um, is for queer communities. So in a way, um, I've kind of personally been kind of working through like, what does it mean to be an architect who works for others? And what does it mean to uh, take on the responsibility to uh, create architecture that listens to the needs of, of a community that's not one's own? And um, it's been a kind of incredible learning experience in terms of uh, maturing through that process and learning how to listen uh, even more. And I, I think it was, it's also a really important project because, off, you know, what does it mean for a historically marginalized community to have the opportunity to build architecture at the civic scale? Um, and we've um, thought a lot about what that means and reflected a lot about what that means after the fact. Um, but. Our understanding of the project and the kind of social progress of the LGBT uh, community, beginning with um, often what's often uh, cited as the Stonewall riots, um, but in uh, the Cooper Donut protests uh, in Los Angeles preceded that by 10 years, um, and a number of other kind of uh, protests that happened specifically in Los Angeles, that this organization uh, grew out of that um, and sort of grassroots um, activism and went through a number of kind of evolutions uh, in which um, different spaces were inhabited, always um, sort of, you know, appropriations or uh, um, occupations of existing, existing buildings. Um, and this was the, the current administration building on Schrader in, um, in West Hollywood. And a huge part of this project was actually understanding what the, the needs of the uh, LGBTQ community are uh, in the context of, of Los Angeles and recognizing that uh, a large part of homeless um, LGBT youth actually reside in, in Hollywood. Um, and so you think of the confluence of the need for um, safe and secure environments for LGBT uh, youth in particular to, to live in, in the kind of lack of affordable housing uh, in Los Angeles, that this project sort of resides at that intersection um, and trying to understand that um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the individuals um, are escaping environments of, of abuse and trauma uh, that are particularly um, difficult for uh, LGBT uh, youth um, in producing a lot of homelessness. So the center um, has this mission, which is essentially providing uh, kind of social services, uh, education, cultural wellness um, to the residents in Los Angeles. And they sort of communicated their, the, mission stage, the mission statement of the organization as kind of these, these four pillars. Um, and we sort of translated that into these uh, kind of verbs of, or these kind of, um, other qualities of acceptance, transformation, identity, and resilience. And the project was actually really discussed um, a lot in terms of a kind of utopian project um, that would be both a um, providing local resources, but uh, really thinking about uh, the LGBT organizations as a global leader, the, the largest LGBT organization in the world. So currently there are, uh, or at the time there was a number of facilities um, uh, scattered throughout Hollywood, uh, which included senior housing, uh, McDonald Wright building, which uh, had a pharmacy and, and clinic, um, the youth center, which was on Highland, the village at Ed Gold, which was a uh, kind of cultural hub with a theater, and uh, the spot, which uh, provided another, another health clinic. And the site, uh, which was acquired, I think, in 2000, around 2000, previous to 2014, maybe 2013, uh, is a 70,000 square foot um, uh, lot here that is just across the street from the village at Gould. Uh, Regan projects here, uh, Santa Monica and Highland. Um, it's kind of old municipal, 
It's our municipal building that was um, demolished at the time. And I think uh, subsequently we have been reflecting on what it means to um, design this building. And I think we realized that in a kind of stepping back, um, that this building is really not, was not about kind of architecturalizing like a queer theory, but really about creating a, a space for care and support of a queer community. Um, and this, I think, became really clear when we were doing research, um, going to other organizations. This is the uh, Harvey Milk School in New York, which we visited, um, which understanding, I think, the power, this is sort of like a very uh, kind of simple epiphany, the power of architecture, power of space, um, became very clear that it was important that um, the architecture didn't look like a typical um, institutional building. This high school is designed specifically not to look, this is not probably the best representation, but not to look like a traditional high school, uh, precisely because the clients who were coming there um, needed a space that kind of disassociated from these spaces of uh, trauma that um, um, really weren't, just really weren't caring for them. Um, so we were, sort of thinking about this, this need for um, a new language that would allow for new associations to take place. Um, often these um, projects have been defined by security and discretion. Um, this is the youth center on Highland, uh, which is more, more or less like an opaque building with this gate, uh, providing a discrete entrance. Um, in order for people to come and go uh, without being noticed. Um, and so we were really trying to understand like what, what the needs were that needed to be addressed. And this idea that architecture oftentimes is sort of thought of as like this kind of like self-actualization of society um, and sort of referencing this, this notion of um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but really thinking of architecture not as just like this um, a sort of rarefied capital A architecture, but an architecture that works within a network of needs, uh, both from kind of providing physiological needs to safety needs, to a sense of belonging, to uh, community and ultimately self-actualization, that this project really represented this kind of network. Um, that was translated into actually a quite complex uh, program, um, which included a um, senior housing, youth housing, a youth center, youth shelter, career center, um, senior center, transitional living program, uh, admin, cultural space, retail. And what uh, we actually added to the program, which was an event space, because we felt strongly that um, there should be a space of celebration and joy and a space of convergence and, and the space that can interface uh, between the, the center and the rest of the city. And one of the kind of interesting tensions was um, this issue of creating a home or a safe space or a sanctuary, but also a civic institution. Um, so how do you um, do both? It's actually quite quite interesting challenge. So we were looking at, um, from a typological point of view, Hollywood courtyard houses as points of reference for scale and kind of the indoor-outdoor relationships. And at the same time, we were uh, kind of exploring um, the map building as a horizontal organizational system that had a certain degree of porosity um, and also programmatic connectivity. And we thought that this was actually a really compelling image because you have Norman Foster's library and is sort of uh, what we thought of as a kind of typological correction that actually provides a moment of figuration within a relatively nondescript organizational system. And then we also thought a lot about um, Venice Hospital in the sense that it, it's a kind of mat that actually connects to the urban fabric, whereas like Berlin Free is more or less an island within a Greek, it's a kind of like a almost pastoral landscape. And so this idea of having a, a kind of field of program that actually could have figuration or identity and oscillate between um, figuration and field uh, seemed to kind of intuitively um, make a lot of sense with understanding that 
Um, this program is really about a kind of diversity of identities that needed to be unified within kind of a single organizational system or a single language that would kind of um, tie everything together. So we went through a number of studies trying to sort of evolve this like map typology within the kind of footprint of the, of the actual site um, and started to develop this language that uh, really kind of took the, um, the kind of programmatic elements and created these puzzle pieces that would create these sort of like figure uh, figure void relationships trying to kind of blur the, the definition of like what is perceived as a shape that's interior versus exterior. Um, this is the, the, the kind of original scheme that we pro proposed. Um, and you can see this kind of like language starting to take shape uh, and the kind of um, the kind of differences in density between the housing and this more porous uh, kind of organizational system, um, which ended up like this, um, actually a lot lower density. Uh, we ended up spending over a year just kind of reprogramming, um, adding program as we kind of learned what the, what the needs of the, uh, the different facilities were. Um, but essentially the idea was that these courtyards would kind of create these buffers between the different programs. The reality of having this kind of utopian um, um, intersection of intergenerational LGBT seniors and youth uh, kind of slowly gave way to the reality that there's actually a lot of uh, separation requirements uh, for safety and security that were, were uh, um, super necessary. Uh, but essentially we're trying to create this sort of like ambiguity between inside and outside and that these courtyard spaces would um, start to actually become the atmosphere of the interiors. Um, one of the biggest moves of the, the project, and I think this um, set up the whole scheme, was to actually avoid a sort of monolithic courtyard, institutional courtyard, but um, use this kind of puzzle piece of program to create this kind of porous uh, plinth that allowed for um, these different uh, programs to be separate but connected by the green space. And the, the big move of submerging the parking, um, every know, everyone knows that you know, parking drives everything here. And um, in order to create this kind of pedestrian oriented campus, we put all the park, I think we're the only scheme that actually uh, suggested submerging the parking, but that actually allowed this kind of interface to happen between the, the neighborhood. And so the, that, the plan of the buildings is like very complex. It's, it's almost a city within a city. Um, and you have, um, you can see the kind of evolution of those puzzle pieces and the different uh, courtyards that, um, sort of penetrate deep into the floor plan to allow light in. Um, but you have the senior housing, 100 units of senior housing, uh, senior center, this is the event space, cultural uh, kind of flex space. Um, this is all part of the youth uh, center with a, with a community kitchen, the dormitories, uh, administrative services that serve both the youth center but also uh, the organization's uh, headquarters, small coffee shop, and then a youth, uh, transitional youth housing um, over here. And I think w uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things about this project is what does it mean for um, uh, a kind of um, evolution of um, queer space as a transgressive appropriation of an existing uh, set of spatial constraints to actually moving into an institutional scale uh, when there are funding streams that are actually pushing uh, things towards the normative. So you end up in this kind of interesting process of negotiation uh, um, which has to negotiate these kind of normative conditions which essentially um, mandate specific amounts of uh, space allocated to um, dormitory beds and things like that in order to maintain uh, those funding streams. So there's this kind of, um, yeah, this kind of interesting friction between what is, what is normative and what is um, sort of pushing against the norm. Um, but we really thought the project operated on, um, operated against the normative at the kind of urban scale in the most successful way in terms of how it created this kind of urban porous form that allowed all these different programs to sort of coexist uh, within this kind of like network. Um, 
And so essentially this, this idea of porosity that sort of gets played out at the, the level of the, the mass scene and the, and the street edge, um, sort of creating all these different, six different entry points for, this, for the, the different programs, um, which actually require the, the youth entrance to be separate from the admin, which is separate from senior entrance, from the senior center. So it's actually this kind of very complex um, uh, kind of incisions into this, this plinth. And so you can sort of see the, the kind of punctuation of the courtyards deep into the floor plate. And a big part of the, the diagram was actually trying to connect this uh, new program to the existing village at Ed Gould across the street and actually turn the street into a public plaza. The original scheme was actually trying to close the street down, but we didn't make that uh, through, through planning. Um, but eventually the idea is that um, what is actually a courtyard here with a fence would act will be taken down to kind of create this continuity between uh, the two buildings from here to here. Um, and so this, this, this language kind of evolved, the kind of the program got thicker, um, the courtyards got a little smaller, um, but we were still trying to kind of like hold on to this, this DNA of, of this kind of like porosity um, and connectivity. And, and the, the way the building evolves in a vertical dimension um, essentially creates these different uh, glass volumes that um, the building it doesn't look the same from any vantage point. Like it's actually, it could be five different buildings. And we thought that was sort of a compelling, uh, in a way, kind of metaphor for um, a project that is supposed to kind of unify a diversity of identities. It's not fixed. Um, these are anamorphic projections that um, cut through the frit pattern um, that align at different points uh, when you stand um, across the street. And so the building is animated at the scale of the car, uh, but also is um, kind of sensitive to the scale of the pedestrian. Um, so there's kind of a, a kind of negotiation or interface and kind of moving in and moving out from the street. Um, and this in West Hollywood. And a huge part of this project was actually understanding what the, the needs of the uh, LGBTQ community are uh, in the context of, of Los Angeles and recognizing that uh, a large part of homeless um, LGBT youth actually reside in, in Hollywood. Um, and so you think of the confluence of the need for um, safe and secure environments for LGBT uh, youth in particular to, to live in, in the kind of lack of affordable housing uh, in Los Angeles that this project sort of resides at that intersection um, and trying to understand that um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the individuals um, are escaping environments of, of abuse and trauma uh, that are particularly um, difficult for uh, LGBT uh, youth um, in producing a lot of homelessness. So the center um, has this mission, which is essentially providing uh, kind of social services, uh, education, cultural wellness um, to the residents in Los Angeles. And they sort of communicated their, the, mission stage, the mission statement of the organization as kind of these, these four pillars. Um, and we sort of translated that into these uh, kind of verbs of, or these kind of um, other qualities of acceptance, transformation, identity, and resilience. And the project was actually really discussed um, a lot in terms of a kind of utopian project um, that would be both a um, providing local resources, but uh, really thinking about uh, the LGBT organizations as a global leader, the, the largest LGBT organization in the world. So currently, there are, uh, or at the time, there was a number of facilities um, uh, scattered throughout Hollywood, uh, which included senior housing, uh, McDonald Wright Building, which uh, had a pharmacy and, and clinic, um, the Youth Center, which was on Highland, the Village at Ed Gold, which was a kind of cultural hub, the theater, and uh, the Spot, which uh, provided another another health clinic, and the site, uh, which was acquired, I think, in two thousand around two thousand previous to 2014, maybe 2013, uh, is a 70,000 square foot um, 
uh, lot here that is just across the street from the village at Gould, uh, Regan Projects here, uh, Santa Monica and Highland. Um, it's kind of old municipal, mun sorry, municipal building that was um, demolished at the time. And I think uh, subsequently we have been reflecting on what it means to um, design this building. And I think we realized that in a kind of stepping back um, that this building is really not, was not about kind of architecturalizing like a queer theory, but really about creating a, a space for care and support of a queer community. Um, and this, I think, became really clear when we were doing research, um, going to other organizations. This is the uh, Harvey Milk School in New York, which we visited, um, which understanding, I think, the power, this is sort of like a very uh, kind of simple epiphany, the power of architecture, power of space, um, became very clear that it was important that um, the architecture didn't look like a typical um, institutional building. This high school is designed specifically not to look, this is not probably the best representation, but not to look like a traditional high school, uh, precisely because the clients who were coming there um, needed a space that kind of disassociated from these spaces of uh, trauma that um, um, really weren't, just really weren't caring for them. Um, so we were, sort of thinking about this, this need for um, a new language that would allow for new associations to take place. Um, often these um, projects have been defined by security and discretion. Um, this is the youth center on Highland, uh, which is more, more or less like an opaque building with this gate, uh, providing a discrete entrance. Um, in order for people to come and go uh, without being noticed. Um, and so we were really trying to understand like what, what the needs were that needed to be addressed. And this idea that architecture oftentimes is sort of thought of as like this kind of like self-actualization of society um, and sort of referencing this, this notion of um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but really thinking of architecture not as just like this um, a sort of rarefied capital A architecture, but an architecture that works within a network of needs, uh, both from kind of providing physiological needs to safety needs, to a sense of belonging, to uh, community and ultimately self-actualization, that this project really represented this kind of network. Um, that was translated into actually a quite complex uh, program, um, which included a um, senior housing, youth housing, a youth center, youth shelter, career center, um, senior center, transitional living program, uh, admin, cultural space, retail. And what uh, we actually added to the program, which was an event space, because we felt strongly that um, there should be a space of celebration and joy and a space of convergence and, and the space that can interface uh, between the, the center and the rest of the city. And one of the kind of interesting tensions was um, this issue of creating a home or a safe space or a sanctuary, but also a civic institution. Um, so how do you um, do both is actually quite, quite an interesting challenge. So we were looking at, um, from a typological point of view, Hollywood courtyard houses as points of reference for scale and kind of the indoor-outdoor relationships. And at the same time, we were uh, kind of exploring um, the map building as a horizontal organizational system that had a certain degree of porosity um, and also programmatic connectivity. And we thought that this was actually a really compelling image because you have Norman Foster's library. And it's sort of uh, what we thought of as a kind of typological correction that actually provides a moment of figuration within a relatively nondescript organizational system. And then we also thought a lot about um, Venice Hospital in the sense that it, it's a kind of mat that actually connects to the urban fabric, whereas like Berlin Free is more or less an island within a Greek, it's a kind of like a almost pastoral landscape. And so this idea of having a 
a kind of field of program that actually could have figuration or identity and oscillate between um, figuration and field uh, seem to kind of intuitively um, make a lot of sense with understanding that um, this program is really about a kind of diversity of identities that needed to be unified within kind of a single organizational system or a single language that would kind of um, tie everything together. So we went through a number of studies trying to sort of evolve this like mat typology within the kind of footprint of the, of the actual site um, and started to develop this language that uh, really kind of took the, um, the kind of programmatic elements and created these puzzle pieces that would create these sort of like figure uh, figure void relationships trying to kind of blur the, the definition of like what is perceived as a shape that's interior versus exterior. Um, this is the, the, the kind of original scheme that we proposed. Um, and you can see this kind of like language starting to take shape uh, and the kind of um, the kind of differences in density between the housing and this more porous uh, kind of organizational system, um, which ended up like this, um, actually a lot lower density. Uh, we ended up spending over a year just kind of reprogramming, um, adding program as we kind of learned what the, what the needs of the, uh, the different facilities were. Um, but essentially the idea was that these courtyards would kind of create these buffers between the different programs. The reality of having this kind of utopian um, um, intersection of intergenerational LGBT seniors and youth uh, kind of slowly gave way to the reality that there's actually a lot of uh, separation requirements uh, for safety and security that were, were uh, um, super necessary. Uh, but essentially, we're trying to create this sort of like ambiguity between the inside and outside, and that these courtyard spaces would um, start to actually become the atmosphere of the interiors. Um, one of the biggest moves of the, the project, and I think this um, set up the whole scheme, was to actually avoid a sort of monolithic courtyard, institutional courtyard, but um, use this kind of puzzle piece of program to create this kind of porous uh, plinth that allowed for um, these different uh, programs to be separate but connected by the green space. And the, the big move of submerging the parking, um, every know, everyone knows that you know, parking drives everything here, and um, in order to create this kind of pedestrian-oriented campus, we put all the park, I think we're the only scheme that actually uh, suggested submerging the parking, but that actually allowed this kind of interface to happen between the, the neighborhood. And so the, that, the plan of the buildings is like very complex. It's, it's almost a city within a city. Um, and you have, um, you can see the kind of evolution of those puzzle pieces and the different uh, courtyards that, uh, sort of penetrate deep into the floor plan to allow light in. Um, but you have the senior housing, 100 units of senior housing, uh, senior center, this is the event space, cultural uh, kind of flex space. Um, this is all part of the youth uh, center with a, with a community kitchen, the dormitories, uh, administrative services that serve both the youth center but also uh, the organization's uh, headquarters, small coffee shop, and then a youth, uh, transitional youth housing um, over here. And I think w uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things about this project is what does it mean for um, uh, a kind of um, evolution of um, queer space as a transgressive appropriation of an existing uh, set of spatial constraints to actually moving into an institutional scale uh, when there are funding streams that are actually pushing uh, things towards the normative. So you end up in this kind of interesting process of negotiation uh, um, which has to negotiate these kind of normative conditions which essentially um, mandate specific amounts of uh, space allocated to um, dormitory beds and things like that in order to maintain uh, those funding streams. So there's this kind of, um, yeah, this kind of interesting friction between what is, what is normative and what is um, sort of pushing against the norm. Um, but we really thought the project operated on um, 
operated against the normative at the kind of urban scale in the most successful way in terms of how it created this kind of urban porous form that allowed all these different programs to sort of coexist uh, within this kind of like network. Um, and so essentially this, this idea of porosity that sort of gets played out at the, the level of the, the massy and in the, in the street edge, um, sort of creating all these different, six different entry points for, this, for the, the different programs, um, which actually require the, the youth entrance to be separate from the admin, which is separate from senior entrance, from the senior center. So it's actually this kind of very complex um, uh, kind of incisions into this, this plinth. And so you can sort of see the, the kind of punctuation of the courtyards deep into the floor plate. And a big part of the, the diagram was actually trying to connect this uh, new program to the existing village at Ed Gould across the street and actually turn the street into a public plaza. The original scheme was actually trying to close the street down, but we didn't make that uh, through, through planning. Um, but eventually the idea is that um, what is actually a courtyard here with a fence would act will be taken down to kind of create this continuity between uh, the two buildings from here to here. Um, and so this, this, this language kind of evolved, the kind of, the program got thicker, um, the courtyards got a little smaller, um, but we were still trying to kind of like hold on to this, this DNA of, of this kind of like porosity um, and connectivity. And, and the, the way the building evolves in a vertical dimension, um, essentially creates these different uh, glass volumes that um, the building it doesn't look the same from any vantage point. Like it's actually, it could be five different buildings. And we thought that was sort of a compelling, uh, in a way, kind of metaphor for um, a project that is supposed to kind of unify a diversity of identities. It's not fixed. Um, these are anamorphic projections that um, cut through the frit pattern um, that a line at different points uh, when you stand um, across the street. And so the building is animated at the scale of the car, uh, but also is um, kind of sensitive to the scale of the pedestrian. Um, so there's kind of a kind of negotiation or interface and kind of moving in and moving out from the street um, and this sort of layering of different volumes that um, sort of break down the, the scale of the building. This is the center, uh, sort of the, the entrance to the youth center. And so even, even the, the, the roof above the youth center is sort of punctuated and kind of just continually sort of break down the, the mass of the building. And all along this edge is uh, very specific openings that um, kind of maintain the level of privacy that's needed for the youth center. Um, but also create a sense of kind of interaction with the street. Um, and so you get this kind of syncopation from a kind of institutional scale down to like a residential, almost domestic scale, um, and kind of the rhythm that moves up the street. And then the flex space, which was um, the program that was added that essentially became an extension of the plaza. <laughs> Um, a space that can be used both by the center, but also um, for for the community. Um, the rooftop, was, which has a, a view overlooking the, um, the the Hollywood Hills, which is actually a revenue generating mechanism uh, for the center to rent it out for different events. Um, and the interior of the flex space with uh, kind of a timeline of LGBT uh, history. Um, in the courtyards, which uh, they're probably more lush at this point, but start to create this kind of interior atmospheres and bring light deep into the floor plate. And a green roof that uh, captures stormwater. Um, and so this portion was complete in um, last spring, April uh, 2019. And in progress now is the senior housing, um, which is located here in the youth housing. Um, essentially, the youth uh, shelter has a, has a continuum of living program, which allows uh, at-risk youth to come in off the street, um, 
get food, have a safe space, have a safe outdoor space, uh, which is very important if you're living on the street. Um, and then graduate into group living, which is located here. And eventually um, these uh, uh, studios will be um, part of a system that allows uh, clients to um, lease their apartments and essentially uh, gain skills to move out of, uh, move out of the center. Um, so the senior housing, um, essentially, I mean, this, you know, housing is, is an extremely challenging typology. Um, we were working uh, within, um, I also really have to mention that this, this project was done in collaboration with Killer Mang Architects, who are also the design architects, um, who have an extensive uh, amount of work in the area and knowledge of housing. So um, we, the project really benefited from this kind of intersection of, of um, our thinking about the project and their kind of experience with um, supportive housing and community-based projects. Um, and the youth uh, housing across the street, all under construction. So essentially coming back to this notion of um, what does it mean for a kind of informal, historically marginalized collective um, manifest uh, a new kind of civic identity? Um, so this is the last series of projects uh, I'll talk about. Um, this diagram, um, in a way, is kind of just describing, I think, what's the kind of condition of 21st century culture was essentially, which is the um, um, time versus complexity as a result of acceleration of technology. Um, we're here somewhere on this curve and human evolution, much slower. Architecture, just barely faster. Um, and then this kind of like dissonance between these different speeds that we're all negotiating, the term that mi military used to describe the contemporary theater of war, which is like VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And then the realization that an architecture practice today sort of tries to negotiate these different speeds uh, between the, the human body, um, the speed of making architecture, and then the speed of technology. Um, and we're somewhere in between, constantly kind of slowing down, speeding up, using the speed of architecture sometimes as a kind of mode of resistance, but um, also finding this, this, this kind of like relentless uh, compulsion to like stay ahead of the curve. And what seem to be defining factors uh, for architecture to contend with today is essentially this, um, this uh, dialectic between our kind of humanistic practice and technology obviously ecology and what are the kind of contemporary collectivities that are evolving out of these uh, kind of critical issues. Um, this project actually, it's kind of in formation, sort of hard to talk about because it kind of evolved from a very um, kind of intuitive space, but um, we were really interested in, in this notion of technology itself that uh, Michel Foucault um, uh, wrote an essay about and essentially technology the self or permit individuals to um, elect by their own means or with the help of others today. Um, I think, you know, in a very basic sense, it's about being kind of strategic, clarifying critical paths, very much about being an entrepreneur. I think it's really important to think of architectural practice as a business, even though it's never kind of built into, I think, the education of architecture. It's something you learn, uh, you know, five years into practice. Um, but I think that also means approaching clients in such a way that you think about unlocking value uh, for them. Clearly, brands, um, how do you communicate stories and identities seems like a fundamental skill set. Um, the hacker seems like it's super relevant uh, type to emulate in terms of hybridizing types and also tools. Um, I think the notion of um, 
sort of defining notion of practice today is that it's kind of post typological. Maybe you know that's been the case for a while, but I think increasingly so. It's not about having expertise in any one particular type, but thinking about similar, I think, to how you kind of learn software, picking up new software, essentially, you can move horizontally a lot easier than going super deep in that horizontal um, knowledge or kind of uh, maneuvering through different types is super critical. Um, I think a lot about what does it mean to think cosmologically in, in terms of consciousness and what does that mean for the future? Um, I know this is problematic, like artists do more than just create new aesthetic experiences, but I think fundamentally it's helpful to not kind of create these dichotomies between social practice or political practice and aesthetic practice that um, aesthetics are social and political. Um, and I think we're trying to undo these kind of camps um, and think about how aesthetic experiences enable new associations. And uh, for example, in the case of the LGBT Center, um, what new languages need to produce in order to allow um, individuals or communities that didn't have a voice uh, before have a a language. And architecture can help do that. Um, I think language is super important these days, and how do you use language to liberate uh, rather than to uh, kind of define or um, minimize. With all that said, I still think architecture is fundamentally about providing concrete solutions. Um, And I think the last issue that our practice hasn't, I think, internalized enough yet is thinking like an organism And what does it mean to sort of create symbiotic relationships with um, ecologies and and non-human entities? Um, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it at that. That's that's the manifesto. We could go back to 1968, but we've we've all been there already. So, Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dom. Uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to your work, and you know, I've always really admired it. Particularly uh, this time, you know, we 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 thinking about your relationship with your brother, and you know, I think it's a super amazing presentation. And uh, thank thank you so much. I mean, I can I can go on and talk to you forever about a lot of the things that you presented. For instance, you know, the contemporary aesthetics. Uh, you know, I th- I think we're living at a time when. Uh, let's say a lot of your contemporaries are relooking at you know let's say a, a type of post postmodernism maybe uh, but you you I mean we've talked about the relationship between austerity and opulence uh, quite a bit and you know you're on the side of closer to the side of opulence and we can talk I mean I can talk about all these things but the thing I, w- I really want to you know maybe bring to the table to today uh, uh, at the end of your talk especially when you talk about manifestos and theories uh, is Let's, let's maybe um, a cyclical resurgence of what uh, the East Coast and the West Coast represented uh, in, I guess, the latter half of the twenty uh, latter half of the twentieth century. There was a time when, in uh, on the East Coast, especially in New York, uh, let's say the measure of success of uh, an architect or an architectural practice may or may not be about buildings. There was a time, right? The New York Fives, or you know grace and what have you but contemporary with that time uh during during the, those years in los angeles uh i think the the idea that la you go to la to build the the qualification of success on the west coast was about buildings so we can trace the stories of the you know case studies homes or or even talk about what one might call the la silvers you know uh but today i think this relationship is completely flipped, right? The idea of a successful practice on the East Coast, yourself, Moss, Soil, for example, 
you know, consistently everyone is an entrepreneur, everyone built. Uh, on the West Coast, on the other hand, you know, uh, we can name a few practices, none of which are really about building. And I just wonder from your observation, you know, uh, regarding the flip, right? There's a flip of the values of the East and the West. Uh, and I wonder what you think about this. I mean, I think in, in the context of our practice, the fact that our first projects were actually in Asia, in Seoul, um, is an indicator that I think we practice in obviously a more global kind of environment. So going back, I think, to uh, New York in the 70s and 80s, super less global in the sense that the opportunities come in, in different different ch channels, right? So it's not so much based on a kind of globalism as a result of international competitions, but for our practice, it's globalism as a factor of like commercial projects. So, I mean, I think that's what enabled us to build, like build things, um, which I think is New York, uh, enabled that just because of the industries, right? Like because of the fashion industry. So we basically rode this wave of fashion um, that I don't think architecture had such a relationship to previously. So in a way, it's this kind of, I think the, the weird uh, confluence of architecture, media, fashion, and branding is definitely specific to our time and place, which I don't think existed in the same way for previous generations. And that's also... I think why we had to kind of shed this kind of idealized concept of architectural practice and start to embrace this kind of like creative consultant kind of different modalities of gaining traction into kind of non-architectural relationships in order to figure out how we could leverage the value of space for people. Um, so, in a way, it's, it's strange, yeah, as you're sort of implying that there's been like an inversion, um, which is, I don't know how to, I don't know what the, if there is a kind of clear cause and effect for that, but I do think it has something to do with this kind of different cosmopolitan kind of New York, which is different than what it was before. Um, is that, is, is this even... <laughs> I don't know, it's a good question. I think it's it's hard to it's hard to discern what's happening in real time. Um hi. Um you started out with the image of you and your brother on the therapist's couch, and then you ended up um with the manifesto. And I was just wondering you know, in those 10 years, what kind of um, maybe conversations between like you as two founders and instigators of your practice, you evolved into kind of like a long list of what an architect may be. And I'm just, I'm just curious about that. Um, that kind of discourse is two people together coming up with a mission statement or a manifesto and how much that relationship kind of, um, you know, evokes all these things along the way. I mean, I think the connection to like therapy is that part of that process is about creating new narratives and new new stories, right? Like, I think you come into a space with certain stories you tell about, you tell yourself about yourself. And then through that kind of like process, you realize there's certain things you do because of certain conditions in which you were you, you developed, right? So um, I think you can apply that to architectural practice as well, that we inherit these preconceived notions of how to practice. And then it's only through the process of practicing that you realize those notions are actually irrelevant and actually holding you back. 
And the, the more you're able to let go of those internal voices, the more you potentially get to move into new spaces and new types of relationships with making architecture. Um, and I think this list is essentially the realization that um, or kind of like self-reflective uh, conversation that um, undoing what I thought architecture or architects do was um, even, you know, having prior experience with other offices, it's, they're all different, right? So like you can't replicate anyone else's practice. You just have to be super honest about how you, how, you know, like where your, what your context is. And I was actually going to name the, the, this lecture when background becomes foreground. Um, that essentially is kind of like emergent phenomena that produce new types or new practices are the result of just paying attention to shifts in some sort of uh, kind of field condition. And the more you tune into these signals, the more you're able to like kind of make them legible and productive in a way. Um, and so that's kind of been the framework in which Chris and I talk about our practice. It's just trying to be like super honest, like, oh yeah, we're not we're not doing it the way these other people did it for these previous generations, or we're not trying to do it like that. Let's just like lean into it. Thanks for a great lecture and um, <clears throat> so many great insights along the way, in addition to such beautiful work. Um, so it, I think um, <clears throat> here at UCLA that it's something that's deeply appreciated. Um, <clears throat> to, to follow on to what you were just talking about, um, I mean, I think this list is really insightful because um, there are ones here that um, architects are trained specifically not to be, that, that, that you're supposed to not think about business that thinking about brand could compromise um, a concept. Um, you know, that strategy is something that's seen as something that undermines um, theory. Uh, you know, it's like, like a common man's theory or something like that. <clears throat> Being an artist, a poet, um, um, but most of all, um, not thinking shamanistically. Like the, the idea that, that somehow spirituality um, of oneself connected to a larger consciousness is something that's, uh, yeah, that you don't learn in professional practice. Um, so I think, you know, there's this, you know, exactly what you said, that there's this great insight in terms of thinking about how you're trained to be an architect and how this list it could be a great definition of all the things that um, we're not supposed to be brought together with great insight, but I think the combination of all of them together is what makes them even more powerful. It's not that you're deciding to be against something in one specific way, but that it's synthetic and that you're taking multiple different um, antithesis these and knitting it together into a new practice. Um, I mean, can, can you talk about that reflectively with respect to the field of the profession? Like, like what, how do you see this as an emergent um, position relative to other things that are going on? Um. Or not. I mean, I, I, I kind of just am working through <laughs> what it means to be a human as much as it means what, what, it, what, it, what does it mean to be an architect. Um, and I think some of these are very much about that diagram of the humanism versus technology versus ecology. They're sort of like roles that you could um, plug into one of those bubbles. Um, and maybe it's not 
I guess I just see this happening everywhere else in the world in some in, in different combinations, right? So um, the kind of rebirth of like interest in spiritual practice that seems pretty at least common in like you know a certain class in a certain kind of cosmopolitan context. Um, the kind of emergence of the art market as a kind of um, also, I think, a, a supplement for a kind of void of spiritual meaning. Like, people go to the museum as if it was some kind of, like, you know, sanctuary space. Um, I think the issue of language is fundamentally, uh, is like a fundamental issue in terms of coming up with, um, yeah, I mean, liberating our, our our notions of ourselves and how to exist in the world, and that seems, for some reason, kind of like ground zero. Um, and I think all the, the the kind of stuff at the top seems kind of like no brainer. Like I'm like like if you're not doing that now as a practice, like I don't know how it's going to work. Um, but you know, that's that's my own that's my own experience. The bottom stuff is definitely more like. The unknown territory, um, um, like the organism. I think these conversations about non-human uh, stakeholders that are emerging, I think, pretty commonly now. Um, it's like what? Had, that seems like an inevitable thing that we're going to have to deal with, and that's like a whole ideological shift for architecture to both be humanistic but also prioritize like non-humans. Like, I don't, I don't know what the answer is there. Um, so I feel like the bottom, you know, five are on the horizon in some fashion, but um, I don't know if they totally translate directly into kind of workflows, but more as I think trying to set up Venn diagrams with everything outside of architecture to be able to have those kind of conversations that seem to be moving certain contemporary cultural phenomena. Hey Dominic, um, I when you were talking about the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, there was a moment where you you said that you don't identify as queer and and you felt a certain um, responsibility in working with that community, um, and it just uh, brought to mind a question for me, which is uh, how much your own personal identity is important in your work or or plays out in your work in all of your other projects um, from a very surface level. I mean, I think you were kind of implying a connection between these Asian American fashion designers and yourself being, I'm assuming, an Asian American. And, um, and I'm kind of curious, um, I'm sort of a slow processor, so I, I, I know that there's something in this list that reflects you as a person, but I'm also kind of curious how um, uh, your own personal experiences are translated into your work and, and how what that looks like for you I think it, yeah that's a good question um, I think it's inevitable but sometimes it's probably more obvious than other times um, I mean I think increasingly like identity is important to just address head on. I mean, we call ourselves a minority owned architecture firm now. I would never have thought about um, saying that five years ago. Um, but I think as a result of working on these projects, I've realized that um, certain identities haven't been at the table making these decisions on behalf of different uh, collectives or stakeholders or. So representation is like, I think, an unavoidable and necessary aspect that I think also to Jeffrey's point, like no one would bring that into a kind of architectural discourse rewind, um, you know, five years ago, ten years ago. I mean, not to say that it wasn't existent, but 
I think it's very much the background has become the foreground in that sense. Um, and in terms of, yeah, I never really, when, I, when we approach these projects, like Asian Americans for Equality or the LGBT Center, we never really thought about, oh, do I identify with this particular group of people or not? Um, until, kind of until afterwards, when we had to figure out how to talk about the project, our relationship to it. Um, so, which I think is also a product of, of the times, right? Um, so I don't know, I guess there's something, I mean, I was going to go show the 1968 slide and like that was a whole other narrative, which is, um, I think biographically, I, I am a kind of strange product of the kind of post 68 generation. Um, father was a um, Chinese guy who went to MIT, you know, was doing like artificial intelligence and stuff at MIT in 68. Had a kind of like, you know, existential crisis, realizing that he was just helping build weapons. Moves back, back to the land. So there's this whole kind of like countercultural kind of thing happening. My mom was a public school teacher. So I think the personal aspect that um, has sort of been a subtext and has evolved or sort of been woven back into our practice is that um, what does it mean for architecture to um, yeah, speak for people who haven't been able to speak on their own behalf and that um, it seems like there is an opportunity to um, not divorce conversations about uh, representation with conversations about like form and um, organization and kind of you know architectural autonomy um, that we really need to figure out how to kind of bring these these conversations together. Um, and I think that these you know certain things in, in that I'm kind of putting in this lecture are my own. Um, uh, evolution of trying to connect <laughs> where I came from, what I was taught, what I've experienced, and have some level of like integration uh, with these different stories that somehow keep getting told to myself in my own head. And the last project's like pretty personal too, like the whole toolkit for the new is kind of. Um, evolved out of, you know, different experiments and, you know, outside of architecture. <clears throat> um, I guess my question might be a little bit similar to yours, but I was interested in the way you used the word language a lot throughout the presentation, and um, I was wondering if you could maybe talk more about that. Is it something that you give to a building or a project, is it something that persists over time, or is it something that's more temporal, that can shift with culture and society and all that? Um, I mean, I think architecture's language has its own history. Um, but I, I mean, I do think fundamentally there is this kind of connection between um, architectural language and kind of new aesthetic experiences, which I think are part of the fundamental amazing thing about architecture, that um, certain languages um, can say certain things, there's certain limitations around it, and others can say other things. So the more plurality we have in terms of these kind of um, aesthetic um, modes of production, the more open-ended and the more, um, it's just better, you know? So. I don't think we are in this kind of like Eisman camp of architecture as language or like semiotics, um, but I think I think it is an interesting metaphor to use. I want to add ecology. It's like the last bubble in the Venn diagram, and also the last in this list kind of organism symbiosis. If it's something that's maybe still latent in your practice or might come to the foreground at some point. I thought the references you gave were very contemporary where the understanding of ecology comes out in the microbiology or the fermentation 
not in the map building or kind of landscape or um, other associations we might have had with ecology maybe 20 years ago. So how do you see that informing your practice, this idea of symbiosis or ecology or landscape? I mean, I think those are all probably have their own implications. I mean, landscape as a way of thinking about space definitely, I think, is in the work somewhere. Um, ecology, I would, to be honest, I don't think we've thought about it that much uh, beyond the kind of typical, like, sustainable <clears throat> things you can do. Um, but I think that is far from this notion of these kind of symbiotic relationships with you know non non human entities, um, which I, I we're the yeah the fermentation is sort of like a, f a first step in exploring what that could mean for our practice. Not only know where it's going to go, but it seems urgent. Um, seems like probably should have been dealt with like way earlier, but. Um, sort of coming, you know, better late than better. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really know what's going to go. Great, thank you, John. Okay. Thanks.